Victory Tabernacle in Del Paso Heights, a ghetto, a true ghetto. And when God intervened on behalf of a little boy who was growing up in a crack house and found his mother's body on Christmas Eve after she OD'd, who saw gang shootings, drive-bys, who <clears throat> slept on the couch in front of a large green TV while drug deals went down all night long. And God <laughs> told us both, I want this one. I want this young man. He's mine. And all he was ordering. <laughs> and he had to hustle to survive. And the church kept kicking him out, and I kept saying, you leave him alone. And I, I kept drawing him on, until finally, um, several times we took him in and took care of him. And, and finally I said to his mother, while she was still living, this time you're signing papers. This time I'm keeping him. This time we're going to do this officially, because it broke my heart every time we gave him back. And after he found his mother, and, and we were just coming back from Haiti, we were in Missouri, he called, crying, and we stuck him on a plane, and he got, <laughs> you remember when he got off that plane? He was walking the Del Paso Heights gangbanger walk, his pants were down around the back of his knees, and Pastor Paul um, said, hi, Donald, turned around, yanked his pants down with his old guy cotton boxer showing and started walking like Donald and he's like, Pastor Paul, no, no. <laughs> he says, I know, I know, I can't do this at your house. I know I can't. It's probably all he had. I mean, those pants would have been big on Paul. Anyway, God did an amazing work, amazing work in Donald. And um, anyway, he's, he's on my heart this week. He's on my heart. Um, God doesn't do small things. Sometimes it looks like a small thing. God didn't do a small thing the day I met Nick shoveling stones for the pastor down the street. God doesn't do small talk, and that's where we're going today. God doesn't do small talk. God doesn't say things like, yeah, I'll have to do something about that someday, <laughs> the way we do. First of all, God doesn't procrastinate. Time is in his hands and is governed by him. So, Father, again, we just come to you to give you all honor, glory, and praise on this day where you have so blessed us in this house. Father God, you are faithful. And you have undertaken on our behalf to do all that we have need of and our need today is to return to you, to return to you our gratitude and the love that you've put in our hearts. You've shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We return to you and to whosoever will. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So insurance companies base their premium rates on what they call experience. There are laws that actually govern the way they do that. Very strict laws. And experience is, is based on the pre premise that whatever happened in the last, usually it's three years, or sometimes ten years, is the best predictor of what's going to happen in the next three or ten years. And they base their rates on the likelihood of how many accidents or how many illnesses, major illnesses, whatever the case may be, they regulate what they charge for premiums. Theoretically, this is how the insurance industry is governed. So they're not just profit businesses. They are governed by and regulated by the insurance industry. Auto insurance companies will tell you that they're justified in raising your rates even though you've never been in an accident because that in itself makes you more likely to be in an accident because you've never been in one before. And statistically, throughout life, you're going to be in an accident, especially if you're a teenager and a first driver. My teenagers bore witness to that with my little, what was that car? Anyway, Tempo. 
It was a tempo. First brand new car I ever had in my life. And um, Paul saw my daughter put dents, I think, in every side. <laughs> and whoever invented statistics, I think they were mean. I just... I, I used to go into the bathroom in statistic class in college and just cry. I couldn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't think I was ever going to get it. And it is still the case that when you're going for a bachelor's degree, you have to pass statistics class. You don't get your degree. You don't graduate. There were people in that class that were taking it for the 16th time. The 16th time so that they could graduate. They thought that statistically they would they'd be more likely to pass. That's <laughs> right. That's right. They, did, they kept failing because they didn't realize it reset oh. each time you tried. <laughs> Personally, that professor gave us another night where we could come and do a study group and he would have us do the homework in class. So if you went to that study group, you at least pass, you scrape by because you got your homework right. I still had no clue about, and I had never taken algebra, which I realized afterwards is a prerequisite. My brother, my brother Joe, who is an engineer, um, he's a Six Sigma statistics certified in like the most um, intense degree of statistical knowledge and ability to apply that, um, but I didn't get that gene <laughs> that my brother got. Um, our weather predictions, they're based on what happens statistically over time. With this condition or that condition in the atmosphere, percentage-wise, it's likely that we're going to get rain. And they'll give you 80% chance, 50%, 20 That's all based on history and historically what has happened. There really isn't any magic. There's a lot of technology, but a magic predictor. I laugh when people say that weather man lied. Well, no, he may not statistically, it may not have happened the way statistics showed it was going to happen. And that's his best ability to statistically predict what the weather's going to be like. The world is in a quandary. The world gets shaken when unprecedented things occur that don't usually occur statistically. It obliterates all those tools of experience. And we're reminded that God is God and we are not. And our experience with God is that he will do what he says he'll do. Because God doesn't speak lightly. He doesn't do small talk. He doesn't make frivolous comments like I sometimes make. I sometimes have to go back and say, you know, what I meant to say was. <laughs> I really didn't mean to say when it comes out of my mouth and I realize it may have landed in a way that may have upset or offended. I have to go back. God doesn't have to make apology for anything he says. If he says I won't, he won't. He can't, in fact, without going back on his word. And he can't do that because he's not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie or even make a mistake. I told mm -hmm. Nicholas last night, remember Pastor Paul, I forgot where we heard it, there was a man who was prophesying and he said, yay, I say unto thee, that in, as it was in the days of Moses, I will cause it to rain, or whatever it was, and then he stood up again and said, yay, I say unto thee, I, even I, thy God, make mistakes. It was Noah. <laughs> he was claiming to prophesy. He was claiming yeah. to <laughs> How often does God get blamed for our mistakes? Okay, God knows oh, I hate Moses. to think <laughs> Yay, I say unto thee. So, the same is true if God says he will. When he says he will, he will. And when he says it's time, it's time. It's time. 
And that word that we received for this year keeps bearing out the fact that it's time. That things keep happening that bear witness to the fact that it's time. It's time, down to the last detail. Uh, revival is the kind of event that turns the world upside down. And it's not unprecedented. But it happens only according to God's will and timing. Yes, there are indicators. People study them religiously. They try to make a formula out of how do we make God pour out his spirit. And, and we don't say that up front, but really that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out a formula mm -hmm. we can follow so that God will move. Some indications are a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. We should always hunger and thirst for righteousness. We know there's a blessing in that. But a deep hunger, a deep thirst, the one that says, I can't go another step without God. I can't do this without God. A recognition of our need for God comes, proceeds, revival. A true recognition that apart from him, there's no other way we can navigate this thing called life, our experience, our experience here on earth. A feeling of helplessness, an overwhelming decline of morals. If that isn't true today, I don't know when it ever was. The decline of morals even in the church. A desire for worship, prayer, for truth, for power in our witness. Those all proceed revival. Conspiracy theories often mingle the truth with the lies of Satan. Mm -hmm. And it can, it's a, it's a weapon that the enemy does use not only to confuse us, but to confuse the unbeliever. We have the gospel, we have the truth. They're hearing the message of confusion, of the God of the internet, of all of these voices are speaking into the world. We must speak into the world. And there is power in our witness that will illuminate the truth. Sometimes you look at someone and you think, there's no way they're ever going to get it. And unless we speak with power and by the Holy Spirit, they may not get it. So, Satan overplays his hand. God is rock steady. That's one of our clues as far as discerning the truth. Discerning the truth. Does it line up with scripture? What do we know about God? in the way he does things. God has sovereignly made throughout history what we call exceptions to our expectations based on our experience. But he doesn't make exceptions to his word or his love or his promises. God is God. So we've been watching, um, we discovered the other night um, a documentary about blue zones. I was sharing that with Lee the other day. Blue zones throughout the world um, are areas in which people are living longer than anywhere else in the world. And they've been investigating, they've been looking at why. What, what are they doing that's giving them long life? They, Okinawa, Japan is the first one they describe, the longest lived people in the world fractional rate of diabetes, unlike the rest of the world. They don't get dementia, mm -hmm. like the rest of the world. They don't get heart disease. And they have the biggest rate, or the biggest number of octogenarian people, 100 years old and more. This documentary we were watching, this 101-year-old lady was playing ring toss, and then she was talking about her 
her reasons, the reason she feels she's lived so long, she was playing a banjo, singing it in a song with a huge, huge, like huge bottle balanced on her head. <laughs> it was just a fun thing for her. She said, in her song, she said, always have fun, always have laughter, make everyone happy, or try to, don't get angry, forgive quickly, talk <coughs> with others, and socialize, enjoy the present, and contribute to the world. It's called Ikigai, have a mission. And that will give you good spiritual health. And all of these are good practices, and none of these things that God has are things that God hasn't already taught us in Scripture. We just sometimes view those things as small talk, incidental. None are guaranteed to be achievable either in our own power. We know things happen, like what happened to Donald this week and his baby. God hears and is moved by our prayers, but he's not open to being spiritually manipulated. We know that Abraham bargained with God over Sodom and Gomorrah, over his nephew. God had a conversation. We may see it as a negotiation, based on his relationship with Abraham. Not everyone approaches God in the way Abraham did, or would, or even could. God knew the outcome before they ever had that conversation. We like to come up with formulas to get results. We pull them out of scripture even, the Jabez prayer. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Lord, won't you bless me and enlarge my territory? Keep me from causing pain. And, and, it, and, and he was so blessed that for a while, even in the churches, there was a little book. I think Randy Outborn put out that book. And we thought if we prayed that prayer <laughs> like a spell, that God would bless us and enlarge our territory. And I'm sorry, but I just personally don't think that that's how it works. There's this line between spiritual manipulation and just walking out our belief. So, yeah, we need to pray our prayers of faith. However, we need to be careful that we're not trying to manipulate God to do something that may or may not be in line with his plan for us. I'm going to try these glasses. Try to take holy relics on the battlefield and say, the Ark of the Covenant will make me win this battle. Yeah. Because it's God who chooses. And I have heard stories of people with those little pocket Bibles with a bullet hit that instead of them. <laughs> but as God leads, it's we that follow him, not him following our God. You can't take faith like a pill and then let it lie dormant, and then take another pill when a crisis comes. I used to, I don't know if this will work either, I used to um, tell people, my coworkers, when I was a law enforcement chaplain, they got, they said, don't ever come to my house in your uniform. We don't want the death angel on our doorstep. <laughs> because we did death notifications. Um, and I said, okay, I won't come to your house in my uniform, but here's what you need to do. You need to decide what you believe before the crisis hits. One of my coworkers, um, her husband was being deployed. I said, don't wait until a crisis comes to decide what you believe about death, life, afterlife, being away from him, the sacrifice he's making. Figure it out now. Learn about it. Is I don't know if there's any, there is nothing more important in your life than to learn what you believe. Because when a crisis comes, you're not going to think clearly. You're going to make an emotional decision, and we've seen people do that. Someone, they lose someone, and they get mad at God. 
because they haven't really come to the place where they know exactly what they believe. One thing in this blue zone that they have in common, and there are other blue zones, the Seventh Day Adventists, we were talking about their lifestyle practices. These are things they've achieved over years of practicing good habits, over years of obeying certain principles of how to eat, how to live. In the case of the Okinawans, they went through a war at which time the only source of nutrition they had, the only food they had for a long time was purple sweet potatoes. And their diet today is still 70% made up of purple sweet potatoes and tofu. Lee, Lee, Lee likes tofu. I, I'm not there yet, but that <laughs> peanut tofu that Natural Foods had the other day look, looked good. But I went for the meat, sorry. But there's no such thing as a spiritual fad diet. There are godly principles. There is God's timing. There is only God when the rubber meets the road. And we have to base our outlook on God experiences, not our human experiences. I've, I've heard it said, I've said it before, when we're born again, once we're born again, we are not earthly beings having a heavenly experience, we are heavenly beings having a temporary earthly experience. We become citizens of the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God. So I've been reading about the beginnings of the Welsh Revival. Now I said we can't just make up a formula. However, we do need to be aware of the circumstances of revival and the things that preceded revival because they tell us when we see these ha things happening and there are scriptures about the end times. When you see these things happening, you'll know. And when we see that hunger, that thirst for righteousness, that moral decline, that, that place where we, we've got to have God, we've got to have God, then we know we're walking in something that often, according to experience, has preceded revival. I'm reading about the Welsh Revival also because my ancestors all immigrated from Wales. There's still a, my maiden name is Seymour, there's still a Seymour or St. Moor, it was originally church, chapel, that I want to go see someday in Wales. So We've all heard about Azusa Street, the revival that happened on our shores, and how William Seymour stuck his head in an apple crate and prayed. And that's a great example of the type of earnestness and passion for revival that we need, but I can go stick my head in an apple crate for years and not get the same <laughs> results. And God would eventually say, um, get up and go do this or go do that according to his plan and according to my relationship with him. God frequently tells his people in scripture, and I'm not even going to scratch the surface of how often he does that today, but I am going to, I did look into how often he tells his people, get up and go or it's time, get up. The command in Hebrew is kum. It's Q, U with an umlaut, a little carrot above it, and an M, and it's pronounced kum. He said it to Abram in Genesis, chapter 13, verse 17, he said, arise, or get up, Walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. He said it to Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 2, and I've got verses 2, 13, and 24. In 
verse 2, he said, it says, Then the Lord said to me, You have made your way around this hill country long enough. Now turn north. And he was talking to the Israelites who had been wandering in the desert for, or in the wilderness for 40 years. And in verse 13, And the Lord said, Now get up and cross the Zerid Valley. So we crossed the valley. Saying exactly what he's saying now. It's time. So in, it's time. You can also, you can extrapolate that to me. Get up. It's time to get going. It's time to move. He was saying what he's saying now to us. And in verse 24, set out now and cross the Arnon Gorge. See, I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, in his country. Begin to take possession of it and engage him in battle. It's time for us to take possession of what God has for Living Water Church. One way that shows us it's God is that people from all walks and other churches are giving to us out of their time, out of their ability, their talent, resources. The Pentecostal Church of God has committed to reimbursing us for that heater. It's on my credit card right now. Thank God that he spoke to Pastor Paul to get our credit in order <laughs> so that we could do that. But they're going to reimburse us. And he's going to, an elder or a, a deacon board member in Pastor Daisy's church is an HVAC man. He's going to install it. He's asked me for the help of two good, strong men. That heater weighs 154 pounds. And it's going to go in the ceiling. Somewhere. One strong woman could lift 154 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'll believe that. God told Joshua, get up and go. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 2, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is A. You know, sometimes you read that, son of Nun, Moses is A, and, and you don't always stop to consider. Why was that put in there? Why does he add, if God doesn't do small talk, why are some of these things made known to us to set a precedent for what's happening there? It just occurred to me, Joshua grew up in the wilderness. That was his experience. And he also came to know God in the wilderness. Presumably through Nun and through Moses, because Nun was Moses' aide. So he got to experience and witness. And he's the one God said, get up. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. God told Elijah, get up. Same word is in there, kum. In 1 Kings chapter 19, is the story of Elijah after he the fire consumes the altar and all those Baal prophets. He runs for his life. 1 Kings 19, verses 3 through 7. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came to a burning bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Lord, just go ahead and take me. <laughs> he said, I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate, and apparently God told someone or something to get up and bake some bread. <laughs> 
He ate and drank, and then he laid down again. In verse 7 it says, Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. When I was about to retire, I was thinking about that little picturesque Italian village where I could walk down to the market every day, select my amazing tomatoes or whatever it is, their bread. I could chat with the villagers because I would, of course, learn how to speak Italian so I could converse with them. And God broke through that dream, that daydream, and said, Coom, get up, go north to McKinleyville. <laughs> and Paul and I joke about it, but we could live that lifestyle for about 10 minutes and then we'd start a program, you know, <laughs> or start the ministry. Anyway, there's a church with no pastor. And if they don't get one, they're going to sell the property. And that's exactly what the case was with this property. Left for death. Uh, yeah. And that says to the world, in my heart and in my thinking, if a church is sold for lack of interest in Jesus, that speaks a terrible message to the community that God no longer matters, even to his own people. And you know, there are many, many empty churches that they can't find a pastor for. Right now, right today. We need to understand, we need revival. Mm -hmm. We need revival. All that junk we took to the... I say we, Jeremy and, and Nick, took to the tune of $289, at least even when it was out there, even with the parts and the ladders and the things that are out there, it tells people we're still alive and kicking. I mean, I, I wanted that removed, but I am glad that even though we're not this finished little jewel of Railroad Street, we are showing signs of life in our community. When I look around and we can count almost on one hand our current congregation, I say like Elijah said in verse 10, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites, or the McKinley Villites, <laughs> have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword, and I'm the only one left, or we few are the only ones left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, get up, go out, and stand on the mountain. And, and hear this one, because we can get excited about verse 11. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass. Oh, wow. The Lord is about to pass by. He said it's time. He doesn't do small talk. If he said it, we can believe it. God told Ezekiel to get up and go. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 22, Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord was on me there, and he said to me, Get up and go out to the plain, and there I will speak to you. If God says to you, get up, I've got something to say to you, would we yawn and stretch and say, oh, can we do this some other time, God? I'm tired. I didn't get enough sleep last night, and, and my back hurts. And No. We wouldn't say that to God, but it almost looks like we're saying that if we don't get up and go. Pastor Paul has a saying, he says, my get up and go, got up and went. <laughs> but at the sound of the voice, at the sound of the trumpet, at the sound of the mighty rushing wind, we're going to get up. Yeah. We're going to get up. Maybe we'll even get knocked down and get up again. <laughs> That's okay by me. God told Jeremiah, 
to go, to get up. Verse 18, Jeremiah 18, verse 1, actually, is it says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best Excuse me, to him. I reference this at Heritage last Sunday night with regard to gender confusion. Does the clay tell the potter, this is what I want you to make of me? No. Verse 5 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord like clay in the hand of the potter. So you are in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, turn, torn down, or destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. If God says it, you can believe it. In verse 9 he says, And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, You could say, or a church is to be planted or built up. Verse 10 says, and this is scary, this should, this should be a scary verse. And if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. I will reconsider. God forbid he would ever say that about Living Water Church. We will do right in his sight if it's the last thing we do. If it's the only thing we do, yeah. we will stay faithful to the one who called us. He hires us, only he can fire us. God often uses the word kum when someone knows what he or she should do, but needs a little push, a little encouragement to actually do it, like Jonah and the whale. If he goes to the trouble of knocking you off your spiritual high horse, it's because he loves you, and his will will be done. His plan is to prosper us. How do I know that? Because he said, I know the plans I have for you, to prosper you. When God says, Kum, he has already laid the groundwork necessary for the task that is set before us. He just waits patiently for his people to say yes. We're almost finished here. Pastor Paul's looking at his watch. <laughs> he just waits for us to say yes. When he says it's time, he has a right to expect us to respond based on our relationship and our commitment to him. Jeremiah in that same verse where we just read verse 10 and he says and if at another time I announce that a kingdom or church is to be built up and planted if it does evil in my sight it does not obey me and I will reconsider the good I intended to do for it. And we are here to say, yes, Lord, we will obey. We'll get up, we'll go, we'll do what you told us to do because we know you will do what you said you would do. Pastor Paul's been receiving words. God's about to break through. God's about to break through. There are some things that need to be done. Nick and Jeremy, they've done an incredible amount of work, and just when they think they're done, something else comes up. But we need help, and we need to be ready. I'm not going to issue a to-do list, but we can all see what needs to be done. And it's my fault when I don't accept assistance offered. We are a body. 
We are a body. In fact, in this book, I'm going to read you an excerpt, but um, one of the things it described is that the full body is men, women, and children. That's the full body operating. If you offer and I say, oh, that's okay, I can do it myself, remind me of what I said today. Because I tend to do that. We need to step out in faith for what God said he would do. And I want to read, I read this Thursday night in our little um, outreach cafe. I'm still thinking about names. Let me put my glasses on. I know I'll need them for this one. This is an eyewitness account of the 1904 and 05 Welsh Revival. It says a great number of young people have been inspired to such an extent as to make them courageous enough to speak to sinners every chance they get. Prayer meetings are held in the trains and many converts are made. The public houses and beer clubs are empty. Old debts are paid. Jealousy vanishes. Church and family feuds are healed. Great drunkards, prize fighters, and gamblers pray in the services and give their testimonies. The chapels throughout the populous valleys of Glamorganshire are full every night. Not just Wednesday, not just Sunday morning, full every night. All denominations have sunk their small differences to cooperate as one body. And the huge processions along the streets send a thrill of terror through the vilest sinners. Owing to these things, the attention of the whole South of South Wales is entirely captivated. The revival is the topic in all spheres and amongst all sections of society, and strong people are overwhelmed by reading the newspaper accounts of it. People begin to pour in from all parts of England, in Scotland, and Ireland to see and judge for themselves of the nature and characteristics of the movement, and most of them say, this is truly the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. What's not to want about that? What's not to want? So, Father, uh, we hear your voice. When you say it's time, we believe it's time. When you say go, we will go. When you say stay, we will stay. Impress on us. Move on us by your Holy Spirit that we will receive the power that you have for us to accomplish every task that you have for us because we know we know that all of this leads to sinners turning their lives over to you, being saved, being added to your kingdom, to your inheritance. And so, Father, just speak to each one of us. Keep us, hold us fast to the plans you've made for this body. Give us increase, Lord. Give us increase, Father God, we ask. In Jesus' name, help us to keep our commitment to you for the sake of your name, for the sake of your church, for the sake of this community, Lord. We're asking in the name of Jesus for you to move, for you to move by your spirit that your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.